Welcome to Change the Narrative. I'm your host, J.D. Fuller. I'm Susie Younger. An African-American licensed psychotherapist. I'm also a licensed therapist. We talk about the isms. We talk about the phobias. Anything that marginalizes and oppresses. As a white woman, I ask the questions white people are too afraid to ask. Everything we are not and everything we are is because of fear. Through a mental health lens, Susie and I will have difficult conversations with celebrity guests, political activists, and everyone in between. Our mind will tell us whatever we want to believe, but the truth lives in the body, and that's where change occurs. Are you ready to change the narrative? I know I say this every week, but we are so excited for our next guest. Meet Daniel Collins. He's a convicted felon. He was just released from prison June 15th of 2021. He has gone from professional baseball to prison, where he met his biggest crime, racism. He has turned his life into one of activism, where he uses his Instagram, aka Confessions of a Convict, to fight for prison reform and activism. Please welcome Daniel. Hi. (laughs) Happy to have you. (laughs) Glad to be here. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for having me. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much for gracing Change the Narrative with your presence and your truth. Yes. And, uh, you know, furthermore, thank you for not making me stalk you to come on the show. That not at all. Cool. It's actually a privilege. It's good to be seen and heard these days. You know, when exactly. you come from an environment where there is no voice, it's nice to be able to have a voice in a platform. So, well, I appreciate your voice. So let's get into it. OK, so you came out of the gate swinging. I mean, you, you didn't take a couple of weeks off. You were like just came out swinging for the fences. So, so tell us where you were about 13, 14 years ago. Tell us who Daniel was then. 13, 14 years ago, uh, I was chasing my dreams of playing baseball. So I signed my professional baseball contract when I was 19. I'm 38 now, so this is a little bit further back. But uh, I had just got released from baseball uh, about 15 years ago. And with that, I, uh, I really had no direction. I was so stuck in drug addiction about 13, 14 years ago. I was so stuck in, I had some abandonment issues, some rejection issues that I didn't know how to deal with. I, my mother left when I was one. Wow. So this was a big part of my addiction was just seeking acceptance and validation in all the wrong places. So, yeah, yeah. Um, that makes sense. So, mm-hmm. so you just kind of found drugs as a holding place, uh, keep you numb. And that's when you got released from playing. Yes, I was released in 2005. And so what did that look like? Explain that for people who might not be understand the language. Okay, so when playing professional baseball, they have a lot of rules that you have to go by, especially in the minor leagues, because they own the rights to you. So they own these rights to you for seven years. And you have to climb the ladder. And now what people don't know about minor league baseball is that the pay is not good and the life is not glamorous. Uh, To me, I equate it to a lot like when I was in prison. You know, it's uh, cheap, free labor, um, or cheap labor, not free labor, but cheap labor. It has uh, long bus rides to a lot of rural communities on broken down buses. So, but what people don't realize is that that life is, is such a grind. And at that point, it's a business. So it's not really about who the best is, it's about who is the most invested as far as financial. And there's a lot of politics to it. So that became an issue with me as well. It took the fun out of it. My entire life I played for fun, I played to win. You know, that's the way I was conditioned to believe. But inside the entire organization in the realm of baseball and sports at that level is that it's more about um, development, player development, and whoever has the most amount of money invested in them really gets the most opportunity. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. So. So when you left uh, high school sports, that must have been a shock to you. Yeah, well, I went from high school to junior college. And the way baseball works is like in in basketball, they have the one and done where you can go to University of Kentucky, you can go to Duke, one of these uh, five star schools, you can play for one season and then you can go off into the NBA, uh, declare your draft eligibility. But baseball works a little bit differently. The way they do it with the Division One schools or NCAA Division one, two or three or NAIA schools is that you um, have to wait till you complete your junior season of baseball. Then you can declare draft eligibility. So what a lot of people don't realize about baseball is that some of your top prospects will actually go to the junior college route, which is now state colleges. Uh, But when I played, it was community college. And 
you are then draft eligible each year. So I got drafted my freshman year at a junior college. I wasn't really expected to get drafted. I went like one and four with a 4.5 ERA, which in baseball terms, it's not good. And um, I was partying a lot. But then I got the call that I got drafted and that there was this possibility of playing professional baseball. Now, this is something that I always dreamed about as a kid, you know, especially not knowing my mom. So one of the things I did when I was nine is I told my Little League baseball coach, I got a birth certificate. This is the first time I realized that my stepmom wasn't my real mom. It was never communicated to me in my house. So when I looked at this birth certificate and I seen that the names didn't match up, I remember taking that birth certificate to my Little League coach and I told him, you know, one day I'm going to play professional baseball for the Atlanta Braves. So maybe my mom would want me. And I remember crying in front of him and he didn't know what was going on, but I never shared this with my parents. You know, I never talked to my stepmom, my dad, but I always called my stepmom, my mom. And uh, so when I finally reached this pinnacle of professional baseball and I still felt empty inside, like it meant nothing to me. You know, it wasn't the money. It wasn't the, the notoriety because at the end of the day, I was still empty. And that's when I turned to the drugs because I got this, a uh, six-figure signing bonus. Uh, so now I had the means as a 19, 20-year-old kid with this amount of money and this emptiness inside, this void that I was trying to fill. And I used that to fuel the addiction. So, you know, one of the things that you mentioned, I think it's so important for people to understand is the lack of mentoring that happens for somebody in your position. You yes. know, you have the talent, you become this product and who mentors you past all the potential um, distractions, addictions, I mean, everything that can bring you down. There's nobody who really holds your hand and says, okay, Daniel, you got this now. Let's figure out how to navigate all the things that are going to get in your way so you can get to where you desire to be, your ultimate goal, right? Absolutely. Just think about the financial side of this. You give a kid a six-figure, seven-figure check, 18, 19-year-old kid who has never had any amount of money in his life, and then you just give him freedom to do whatever he wants. You know, it was really the first time I got out from underneath my parents' thumb. Uh, my dad tried to guide me a little bit, a little direction, but I didn't really have any mentors outside of that. And then yeah. get, you get this check. It's not like they sit you down and teach you how to invest this money, teach you how. I had no sense of how to budget, how to uh, balance a checkbook or any of those checkbooks back then, you know, or anything to do with any kind of, I had no financial education. So uh it was easy for me to get caught up in that lifestyle to think that this was just going to continue to, to uh, perpetuate forever. I'm going to continue to have this money forever. And uh, there yeah. was no direction. Yeah. And I mean, your dad, I'm sure he did the best that he could, but he wasn't a, in the you know business of sports. So how would he know how to really navigate? Yeah. It? And at that point, too, it's like I'm an adult. He can't really tell me. I mean, he he would tell me like some when you get my age, you're going to regret this. Um and my mind at the time was that I just didn't think the end result, nobody goes into addiction or drugs thinking that the end result is going to be what it is. You know, I didn't think that I was going to, uh, I didn't raise my hand and said, sign me up for prison. You know, I didn't, that was, you know, it's just one little piece at a time. And eventually you get to that point when you look back and you're just like, wow, I've lost everything. I've lost every material possession, but even more than that, I've lost my own dignity. So. Yeah. And I, I would add to that. I don't think any 19 uh, year old says, oh, someday I'm going to be 40. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not. Right. It's especially a 19 year old <laughs> who suffers from addiction because already addiction is very tunnel vision now, now, now. And in this world that we live in, this instant gratification, uh, microwave oven type world, it's right. now. It's, everything's very impulsive. Yeah. Absolutely. Somebody shift gears a little bit. I want to talk about uh, the turning point for you. You talk about that in your Instagrams, you know, this mm -hmm. idea, and I'm just going to frame it the way that I would say it, which is, you know, you went from being this proud, uh, active in your racism, you owned it, you know, you, you were who you were. Mm -hmm. And you, you turned that around to using your privilege responsibly and wanting to educate others mm -hmm. to take responsibility for theirs. How, what, what was that turning point like for you? Like, what clicked? How'd the light go on? Well, I'm going to tell you this. Long before I ever had any kind of explicit racism, you know, I was like the closet racist that was really cool. I would tell you how many black friends I had. I would tell you uh, I went to an all black high school because I did. I went to a school that was half black. So I had like all these ideas. But then I would turn around in, in my circle of friends and the conversation would change. And this is how it was and a lot, a, a lot of times, if I get completely honest. I also had these implicit biases and prejudices that I wasn't even aware of. 
uh, especially when I got introduced to the criminal justice system, because my idea was that I'm an addict. I look the way I do. I'm educated. I came from this background and those, I'm not like those drug dealers. And my perception, my point of view of those drug dealers, was that they were all people of color. That was my kind of my experience. So that's how like I judge and stereotype it. And I didn't even realize it. And it hit me right when I went in front of my attorney and I'm saying this to him. And he looks at me like, how dare you even act like you're better than, you know, like, and uh, so I go to prison and I meet some of these drug dealers and I become friends with some of these drug dealers. Now in prison, it's a different environment in a hostile environment like that. You could be, especially with gang affiliations, you could be, let's say the head of a blood and the head of a white supremacist gang and have completely different ideologies and beliefs but you're going to have this level of respect because at any minute in a hostile environment, you could lose your life for an act of disrespect. So in this environment, we will agreeably disagree. So um, this is all happening. I'm talking to this guy who happens to be a drug dealer and he's looking at me like they, they call me DC in prison, but he's like, I cannot believe you stole from your parents. So he's looking at me like I'm the scum the same way that I'm looking at him. He's like, he was like, you know why I don't steal from my parents? I don't have that luxury because I'm too busy trying to take care of them. This is why I sell drugs. So it started to change the narrative. It started to change my perspective of like, what's really going, what are some of these underlying issues? Now, when I met Rashawn, we both had completely different ideas. So Rashawn uh, and I became really good friends in prison. Now he was a Muslim. I was Christian. He was black. I was white. We were people in prison who would normally not integrate, especially friendships other than if we were just doing some kind of business or something together. And uh, he continued to, to just have grace and patience with me. Like he never judged me. I'm trying to convert him to Trump. I'm trying to convert him to a lot of these ideas. And the whole time I'm not realizing I'm the one that's being converted. So he used to call me the white devil. I used to call him the black lion because he had black lion tattooed on his arms. But we had this level of respect for each other because in that environment, you have to. And both of us being from the same area, it kind of opened the door for conversation. And over time, it started to change. I didn't get it right then, but um, it was something that was set in motion. And I, I got transferred to another camp and I had my wife continue to stay in contact with him because I knew there was something special about this person. And I told him, I said, when I get out, I'm going to stay in contact with you. Meanwhile, I'm still trying to survive and navigate the waters of prison because it's a shark tank in there. You're either predator or you're prey. And a lot of times you're forced to choose a side. So this is when I started to become explicitly racist. Now, think about this, too. In 2016, you had Trump running for president. You had this Black Lives Matters movement. And all this is going on on the outside. Now, we're behind the fences when this is going on. And it's creating this perfect storm because what's happening is the rhetoric that's coming from the Republican Party and Trump is emboldening people who are closet, who are implicitly biased to now explicitly, overtly express this. So this was my case in prison like that. And then now the Black Lives, Mo Black Lives Matters movement is challenging the American institutions. Now, mind you, my entire life, I've been conditioned to believe that I have to uphold the Constitution. I have to defend a system that by its very nature, by its very design is racist, you know, and I was defending this because it became a part of my identity. So when these institutions were being attacked, when these statues are being taken down, I'm looking at it like it's who I am, like a part of me is being taken down. So like I had to separate, I had to detach myself from that. And that was one of the hardest things to do, but learning through Rashawn's experience, learning through the experience in prison, because you're exposed to a lot more. You got to figure that there are a lot of African-Americans in prison. So you're exposed to the culture, you're exposed to like the underlying issues and you see now, is there a lot of hatred skewed? But if you get past the superficial, the fluff, and you can really see what's going on underneath. And that's what happened to me. But I had to, since I'm already committed, I'm already waist deep in this whole gang affiliation type. Right, like, right. I got to just try to get out of there alive. In my heart, I know that in my mind, I know that this is not for me. At this point, I made up my mind. But right. uh, a part of that affiliation is getting this political ink on you. Now, I would not do it. So that was creating issues. I was like, I just need to get to my release date. If I can just get to my release date, 
Uh, I'm going to get in contact with Rashawn. We, him and I had already talked about this confessions of a convict idea, this, this platform that could be created because I feel like we had a blueprint for engaging with people. Because when I got out here and I realized how serious it is, it is so hard to engage with people who don't agree with you politically, religiously, even uh, racially. So the relations, because the, we automatically just shut them out. If people don't agree with us, we just shut them out. And we don't take the time to develop that friendship and that relationship with people. Sometimes people want to see how much you care before they hear how much you know. And that was the issue. See, Rashawn showed me how much he cared about me, about humanity, uh, just uh, love in general, that, that unconditional uh, love, that grace. And by doing that, I was able, he was able to build that report with me that gate that opened the door to understand it, that opened the door for me to hear how much he knew, to hear his experience. Cause I'll never understand what it's like to be a person of color in this country. Uh, I tell my wife, you'll never understand what it's like for me to be an addict. But when we start to show compassion, we start to change that approach to it, then it becomes easier to have uh, some kind of empathy for people yeah. and, and love for mankind. So that's no, pretty much what happened. <laughs> no, that's amazing. That's an amazing summary. It's an amazing story and journey. And, you know, one of the things that I think that uh, I say all the time, I just really believe it's way too much based on believing as opposed to accepting. You know, yeah. it's like, I don't believe it's that way for you. Is it really asking mm -hmm. a lot of questions to determine whether or not I can ex you know, understand or believe you as opposed to Daniel, if you say it's like it is, I accept it. Take because it at face value. Yeah, it's your experience. Like mm -hmm. who am I to say that it's not? That's what happens with marginalized populations. It's like, yeah. oh, but well, you know, but when, you know, there's LeBron, James, you know, it's like, yeah. hey guys, that's what you got. And that same, I would want that same grace extended to me. Like, I don't want people to be like, well, I don't know if I believe that he's not a racist anymore. You know, like, I don't want people to question that and just take it for what it is and let my actions show, you know, let, you know, and, and my experience is my experience. This is my truth. This is what I went through. And a lot of people may not believe it, especially people that just get snippets of me in an Instagram video or a TikTok video. And they don't take the time to really get to know someone. It's easy to judge somebody in 30 seconds, a minute or a three minute video. But when we take the time to really sit down with people and dialogue, then that out of that is birth understanding. Well, I got to tell you, you've eliminated so many of our questions right I now. I know. I know. I mean, I'm like, nine is gone. Uh, <laughs> Four has been answered. Uh, okay, now I found my, my my space. You did an excellent job of giving us all the information we were interested in. So I'm going to shift gears just a little bit. It's kind of on the same context, but the idea of uh, you know the prison industrial complex, white supremacist system of injustice as it exists today. Give me your spiel on that because I know you talk about that a lot. Yeah, I mean at the very if you look at the historical context of everything, if you just look at uh, the abolishment of slavery in 1865, and then you look at our first prison boom, when we could no longer say that we are legally allowed to own slaves. So we can no longer say this, so we just repackage it. And what we do is we make people of color now a crime. It's now be a crime, it's a crime to be a certain color. So now we get our first prison boom, and you got to understand, too, that when people got to understand is that when slavery is ab abolished, it messes up the economy, especially in the South. And it's such an integral part of the economy. So how do we get this labor? How do we exploit this labor again? Because we're not allowed to do it over. So repackage it. And what we do is start arresting people. Now, fast forward 100 years in 1964, 1965. Lyndon Johnson passes the, the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, and now African Americans have the right to vote. And now they've got a little bit more power or voice. Now, of course, this is going to upset the political establishment. Right after that, people get afraid. Look who comes into office. We get the Nixon, we get the Reagan. Now we get the second wave of a prison boom. In 1970, we go from 300,000 inmates in 1970 to 2.3 million now. And it, the numbers are just astonishing. But the reality is, is that uh, 
and that we create this war on drugs, which disproportionately affects people of color. It disproportionately affects marginalized communities. We create this, uh, this false narrative of law and order, and we start locking up people, uh, and then we just exploit the labor. Now we just put the labor uh, it, for people in prison, and then I look at it now, the way it's going, it's still going on right now. I remember seeing on the side of a van when I was in prison, it said saving taxpayer dollars. And it was talk, It was a work van, right? So we're saving taxpayer dollars. We're not counting the 30,000 a year we're spending on inmates to, to be in prison, to pay for, to warehouse these inmates. And then these same inmates that we're putting into the community that we deem safe, because in prison, you've got to have a certain custody level to be safe enough to work in the community. And, uh, in, in order to do that, you have to have minimum or community custody. Now, mind you, we can have these same people in the streets in Florida, they don't pay you yet, working for a paycheck, working to support their families, uh, establish community ties and career ties. But the reality is, is that the whole prison industrial complex was to uh, generate money and profits for certain entities. And if you just look who's at the top of all these entities, I used to tell Rashawn all the time, and Rashawn put it to me this way, and then I, I, now I share his story with those people. Rashawn said, just imagine being the only one in the courtroom that is of color, that you're the public defender, your prosecutor, your jury, your judge, the bailiff, everybody in this courtroom is white and you're the only person of color. And then I take it a step further when I look at my experience inside prison and I see in many times, especially in North Florida, a lot of the rural communities, the people who are in charge of these, these prisons are the good old boy system. Yeah. And the, it's still that old mindset, but um, it's no different today than it was before. We just modern day slavery. All we did was, yeah, sorry. No, I'm, oh, okay. I'm, I am just, can't, I'd like to nod my head off at this point. Like, so <laughs> right? the, the yeah. new Jim Crow law. I mean, that, you know. The new Jim Crow law, yeah. That, uh, Michelle it. Alexander, uh, Brian Stevenson, what he's doing with that equal justice initiative. I've learned so much just from, just in a little bit of time that I've been out and having access to more information and more resources. It's just, it blows my mind away. Yeah. I'm just amazed at, yeah. you know, the, the underlying issues. If you have generations and generations of trauma and, this is, this is why I hate when people say, and I was, I used to argue this and I used to use the Candace Owens book to kind of beat it upside people's head. You need to convert to Trump. You need to take personal accountability and it's personal accountability. It's culture. It's not the system. And then once I learned that the system created this culture, that it perpetuates this culture, if you've got years and years of trauma, years and years of locking up fathers and taking them out of the home, and then you're not giving them any skills. Like I said, here in Florida, you don't, we don't pay our inmates to work. So at the end of their sentence, after 20 years in, you give them $50 and a bus ticket and you send them on their way and say, do not commit any more crimes. Now, if a person now has the stigmatization of being a convicted felon, it's going to be hard to get a job, especially a job that's going to pay a livable wage. What are they going to go do? Nine times out of 10, they're going to result back to the same, resort back to the same things that got them locked up in the first place. Yeah, and I used then, to, oh, yeah. Good, good, sorry, good, finish that. And then we're just gonna, and, and, and then we're gonna shake our finger at them when the crime happens, you know? It's the system that created this, the culture. And it, it, there's so many layers and there's so much depth to it. And it, it just, it's mind blowing, really. It is mind blowing and it's not a system of reform. It's not no. at all a system of reform. It was never designed to be. You know, and the, which, that's why I take issue when people, people say this is not who America is. It's exactly who America is. Yeah. And it's exactly what it was built uh, to do. And, you know, this idea that uh, you, people are just supposed to know what to do when they get out. You know, I worked on, on um, Skid Row in L.A. doing um, um, assessments for inmates who just got dumped, literally dumped off from the, the prison bus and, you know, have to assess them to see if they can go to work or yeah. if they have mental health issues and can't work. And it was like, what that I, that just makes no sense to me and just without heart the system has no heart it has no soul it does not care you do not have a shot see when you take a person from their family from their careers from their community ties especially somebody like Rashawn who went in at 16 the odds are the deck stacked against them the odds statistical odds are completely against them you know the likelihood of him joining a gang inside prison which he hasn't 
amazes me. The fact that he's taking the time to learn and educate himself, because that's not the norm. You know, he's in a, a nominally in that system. But this is the thing. I look at my own situation. If I didn't have my wife who owns a hair salon, if I didn't have my dad, you know, who has worked 30 years that, that helped me with the resources that gave me a car, who helped me get a driver's license, who helped me have a roof over my head, I wonder where I would be because I'm 30 days out. I've applied for numerous jobs. I still haven't got accepted. I passed the whole interview process, but then nobody wants to hire me. They say, oh, it's within the last seven years. We can't, you know, we can't hire you. So like, what are the odds of people of marginalized communities, people who do not have the same resources, people who have worked for 20 years in prison, did not earn a paycheck and get out with nothing. What's the odds of their survival? Absolutely. There is none. And this whole idea that our system is supposed to be punitive is ridiculous too. There's no restorative justice. See, restorative yeah. justice includes not only the victims in the communities, but also in includes the perpetrator. We have to rehabilitate and restore the perpetrator to right relations with the victims, with themselves, with the community, their families, because if we don't do that, 95% of our prison population will one day be released back into society. But if we're going to release 95% of our prison population back into society, but we don't treat them, we treat the crime, but not the offender, because we're so stuck on them being a criminal, being bad people. And that's the mindset. And until we change that approach to that, then this crime is going to continue to perpetuate themselves. You can't fix something that's broken with something that's broken. And that's the, you know, that's the reality of our system is that we're telling these people the, these people that have been to prison, these people that have experienced these years of trauma, generations of trauma, because most people that are in prison come from dysfunction, they come from poverty, they come from broken families, and then you expect them to just fix themselves while they're being warehoused inside a system that's not conducive for uh, rehab or rehabilitation, and we, we, we know that the punishment is, there has to be accountability, there needs to be consequences, absolutely, but let's make this cycle come full circle and let's restore the offender too. And that way they can become productive members of society. And that's where we fail as a, on a systemic level. And Absolutely. people don't realize this because we just want to focus on whether criminals don't commit crime. But once that bullet's already out the gun, that bullet can't go back into the gun. You know, it's already been shot. So like, it's too late. We're past that, you know, and it's Absolutely. generational. And that's what it keeps happening. It gets passed on. Now this person who has no skills, no training, no treatment for criminal thinking, no treatment for uh, drug, drug addiction, no treatment for uh, mental health issues, all this stuff. And now they pass it on to their children and their children's children. And it just continues to perpetuate a cycle that um, until the system does something that's more effective and we change our approach and our mindset towards criminals, towards uh, people of color, marginalized communities, poverty, and we, we start to address these issues, then there's not going to be change. The crime rates are going to be where they are. That's amazing. And that's another thing, too. Putting people in prison doesn't eliminate crime. It doesn't lower it. It just displaces crime. You take Look. crime from the public eye and you put it inside the system. Because guess what? Murder's still happening there. Sexual assault still happening there. Death, drugs, you name it, it still happens in the underworld. Right. But the thing is, is that people don't have to look at it. They yeah. don't have to see it. And that's mm -hmm. what makes it okay. And that's yeah. the selfishness of our society. All right, yeah. I want to get back to you for a minute. That was amazing. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I want to know, what's the biggest life lesson that you took away from your um, experience behind the fences? Like, what, if you had to just sum it up in one, what, what would it be? Two things. To thy own self be true, mm. and this too shall pass. Damn, Daniel. That's so... Good. Every spiritual truth that I've ever read on is always to thy own self be true. I had to get honest with myself before I could be honest with anybody else. And that took a lot of reflection and looking in the mirror. So that if I'm not true to myself, there's no way that I can be true to you. I can be true to society as a whole. And then in the darkest times, this too shall pass, but also to remember the good times shall pass too. Everything is fleeting. So every moment's fleeting. You never know, uh, what's gonna happen, what's around the corner, what's waiting. So it just helps me to stay present in the moment. Uh, and, and in prison, it's hard to do that because you're always thinking about your past or you're always thinking about the future. And um, a lot of times it's just learning to stay present in the moment. So I just had a side thought because that was just so profound. Uh, we have to do another show with your wife mm -hmm. because I wanna have a conversation with the two of you about how did you get through it? So just put that in the back of your mind, start working yes. on her now. 
and we'll okay. schedule that. All right. So yeah. the, the, the next question I have, and then I'm going to turn it over to Susie, is, um, you know, you said it already. Uh, mental health uh, issues are inevitably exacerbated in uh, the prison system. Mm -hmm. I have an idea of what your answer is going to be, but I think it's important for you to say, how did you manage yours? And how did you come out just seeming like, you know, this too shall pass, basically using what you said? <laughs> I don't know. For me, I think it was more, see, knowledge is power, but wisdom is application of that knowledge. So like I had to develop this. I, I, I did a lot of reading. I, I had my own personal relationship with God. I used to have a toxic faith that was, uh, I used to try to proselytize people and do all these things, just another form of oppression, because that's the way I was taught on an institutional level. And I had to just come into my own spiritual truth and my own realities that I don't have to formulate my ideas. People always want to tell you what to think, but nobody wants to teach you how to think. And that's when prison, I just had to learn how to think myself because with drug addiction issues, uh, with mental health issues, uh, my abandonment, rejection issues, a lot of these things, this need to be accepted and validated, uh, it's hard to keep yourself in check sometimes. So even in prison, I developed a small circle of influence. People like Rashawn, who would encourage me. Uh, I had family ties, which I was fortunate that helped me with that whole process. But let me tell you something about uh, mental health issues and, and, and substance abuse is issues in prison. Even when they implement substance abuse programs in prison, you've got to remember like the way it works is that you will leave your dorm a lot of times and go to this class and it's group therapy, but you're not in your own isolated part of the prison. Now, sometimes that you are, but there are other times like the one that I went to, you mm -hmm. go right back to an environment that is not conducive to rehabilitation and yeah. prison. You're not allowed to show emotion. You're not allowed to show vulnerability. Anybody who knows anything about the recovery process, anything about dealing with mental health issues is that you got to open up and get real. And if I'm not going to open up and get real, if I know this person that's two seats over from me, he's got a big knife in his, in his pants. I know that he's going to pray and try to exploit my weaknesses when I get back to the dorm. So like, if I don't have an atmosphere that is conducive to rehabilitation, to addressing these mental health issues, then it's, I'm, I'm going to continue to put up this facade. I'm going to continue to have this barrier, this wall up that you're not going to be able to get in and there's not going to be any real change. So like, um, that's why I had to take it upon myself in that system is just to find a few people that I can confide in and that we could build with, you know, and Rashawn, that's why I said he was such an integral part of that because he did, he had, dude, I, I'm just still going away at somebody who basically state raised, who grew up inside the system and, and to have the emotional balance that he has to have the level head and the amount of wisdom that he has 16. He didn't go to high school. He didn't have a driver's license. He didn't go to college. You know, he's been inside a prison working for the state for 10 years now and what he has done with his time and the person like the seed was planted and it had a major impact on my life. Uh, I didn't, like I said, I didn't get it right away. I still had to keep up this, this external, but it was a survival mode because right. in prison, it's all about survival. When you get back, released back into society, we got to learn how to live. Yeah. So, um, and it's still like I told him the other day, I had some uh, disappointments with a job where I had an opportunity for a job. Um, part of it was like a marketing where I had to go into the community and knock on doors and stuff like that. Well, they were going to bypass the whole background check. But then the CEO was like, well, because your burglary charges, we don't know if it's a good idea that you go knocking on doors in the community. I totally get. But it was a disappointment because I was for once I was excited about employment and here it is another letdown it was the first time i had a thought of wanting to go have that drink or wanting to go get high so but i had to be honest with that and i shared that with Rashawn. you know when he had called me and i told him like and just to be able to have somebody you can be, be real with and open up with and tell him i you know i shared it with my wife before i would never tell my wife that because it would freak her out if i told her that i want a, an idea of getting high she's automatically going to lose it and think that you know like but just because I have the thought doesn't mean I have to act on that thought. So like, yeah. but I need to be able to have a safe space where I can talk about these things, you know? Yeah, because secrets are poison. Yeah, and we're only you know? secrets, absolutely. Uh, so wait, let me just, I just before I pass it over to Susie, I wanna ask, um, I've just been so blown away by Rashawn's story. What is his last name and how can people reach out to him? Rashawn Clark, 
Uh, he's at Avon Park Correctional Institution Work Camp, 8100 County Road 64, Avon Park, Florida, 33825. You can also download the JPay app, add him on JPay. His uh, DC number is K77195, State of Florida. Uh, I will tell you that um, he is being censored a little bit with some of his mail and his videos that he's been sending out to me. I guess one of the things in prison is that you're not allowed to operate a business or any kind of financial thing. So like he has to follow those rules with us trying to raise money for his GoFundMe page to, we're trying to retain an attorney. Uh, he believes that his constitutional rights have been violated, um, his due process, equal protections. Clause. So we're trying to get an attorney for him in that matter too, um, because what happened to him is just, it's ridiculous. So. So what's the GoFundMe page so we can promote that as well? Do you know? Uh, I have the link in my bio on my Instagram. And okay, that's TikTok. good. Tell them, who you're, tell them what your, uh, your um, okay. IG name is. TikTok is Confessions of a Convict. Instagram, Confessions of a Convict. There's a GoFundMe link in the bio. Uh, attorney for Rashawn Clark. And if also, if you know any constitutional civil rights attorneys, please have them contact me. Uh, every attorney that I've called... A lot of people don't want to go into the jail. They call it a petri dish for COVID. So the couple that I've called that are local, um, they don't want to. We do have a couple of people that have some legal experts looking at it. But I mean, he has a legitimate case. Like he's exhausted all his criminal remedies, but on a constitutional level, uh, he he definitely has a legit case. I mean, all right. yeah. All right. Let's get him the help he needs. Go ahead, Suze. Yes. Whew. Daniel. <laughs> Hi. As a, hi. <laughs> so, so as a white person, I'm just now beginning to know how much I don't know in this anti-racism work. Mm -hmm. And my eyes have started to open about the racialized trauma Black people and other people of color face every single day. And yes. to be honest, in retrospect, I can see where my white fragility shows up. Mm -hmm. What about you? Where does your white fragility show up? Uh, anytime that the institutions were attacked, uh, I took it as a personal affront. So that made my whole ego and everything very uh, fragile. Like I just took it very personally. Um, so that's definitely a way anytime. Dude, there were so many times that like, I just took everything so personal. Like if you would say something about white people, like one of the things like when people would start saying, uh, African-Americans can't be racist. That used to show, like, it used to really hit my ego, like, because I'd be like, how is that not possible? You know, I just came from an environment where there was a lot of, you know, derogatory terms spewed at white people. And so I used to take that very personal as well, too. And then, um, but then once I got past the very superficial level and understood that this is just a reaction to years and years of trauma by our ancestors. So this is some of the ways that it showed up in my life. For sure. Wow. Okay. This is my last question. Um, what do you hope that white people do other than just thinking that having a friend from a marginalized community is doing the work? What do you want white people to know? Uh, let's change the narrative. Like you said, like, let's begin to take action. It's not enough to just um, try to do it from afar or try to to, to talk about it, let's acknowledge it. Let's get honest about it. Let's have these real conversations and let's get, let, let's let our egos go. You know, it's not a personal attack on us. Let's just imagine um, if our entire narrative, our entire history, everything was being told from a black perspective, you know, how would we feel? Because our ancestors basically created the environment that we live in today. You know, they're responsible for, but black people's, African-Americans, people of color, they're same thing. Like their conditions today were told by our ancestors. So like their history was rewritten and people don't want to acknowledge that. These are facts, these are truth, you know? And that's the thing is that for so long, I was so indoctrinated with the, the viewpoint, the point of view from a white person's perspective, you know, our history books when I went to school and I had a teacher reach out to me and said that that's beginning to change in the school system, but just now, but when I remember like, so it's just letting 
the ego down. It's understanding and empathizing where people come from. And it's easier for me because I get addiction. So I, I understand addiction. I understand how it works that it's the drugs are just a symptom of the problem. You know, it's an underlying issue. So when I look at the, the reactions to what's going on right now in our society that I know, like one part, one thing I used to hear people say in prison, well, they're out there burning down cars and buildings and, and businesses and stuff, even to their own people. And it's like, you got to look at where this is stemming from. You're looking at one little micro act in the grand scheme of things. It's like, imagine this, that you get beaten, you get verbally abused, emotionally abused, you get raped, you get killed, and then you get told by your uh, oppressor, your perpetrator, that you just need to stop being the victim and you need to take accountability, personal accountability. Like, imagine if that happened to us and how we would feel. You know, we're being offended on such a micro level and it, it's, it's nothing compared to like, so that's what I take a look at my life. I, what, have I, what I've experienced is nothing compared to what generations and generations of people of color have had to deal with. And that, that was the honest look that I had to take it. And, and in order to do that, I had to detach myself from everything I've ever been taught, even subliminally or even overtly. Like there's a lot of things that I've been taught that I don't even realize that I've been taught because it's just become a part of me. It's such second nature. So like, I still make mistakes, you know, like I have not arrived by any means. You know, because it's such a process. Oh, I know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Humility in its purest form is to remain teachable. So as long as I remain teachable and open-minded to the truth, and that's what I would tell white people is just, just take down the barriers, just take down your guard for one minute and just try to have some kind of compassion and empathy and understand where people are coming from. And that's it. We always want to be understood rather than seek to understand, you know, like, and that's the problem is that, it's always me, 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 you know? And if we take the, the lens off of us, we take the magnifying glass off of our lives and let's just look, if we even begin to look at, you know, what other people have experienced, people of color in this country, we look at the data, you can't deny the numbers. One thing about it, you can deny everything else, but you can't deny the numbers. So that's why even when I tell people with systemic racism, like, oh, it doesn't exist. I mean, just look at the numbers, look at the end result. Like the numbers do not lie. And then I always hear, well, who controls the numbers? But it's just like, it's always deflection, deflection, deflection. You know, nobody wants to look at what's right in front of them. I'm guilty of it. So I get it. Like anything you can possibly say, I've, I've argued it. I've done it. So, um, and it's a good feeling to be on this side of things now. It's a little, no longer be part of the problem, be part of the solution. But um, it's just, uh, let's change the approach, you know? Well, you know, JD always says it's the feeling in the body. And honestly, when I was looking at your stuff yesterday and I've been following it, there was a part of me that was like, hmm, do I trust him? Is this like a momentary thing? And I can say just sitting here, I feel, I absolutely feel that you feel everything that you're, I feel it. And so I just want to thank you for coming on and speaking you're your good. truth. Yeah. And I'm going to turn it back over to JD. All righty. Thank you. Uh, Daniel, we definitely have more talking to do. I've got some <laughs> ideas about things. So okay. we, we, we are connected now. Yeah, and, I agree. Uh, you agree. Right on. Yeah, I, and, I, I um, love the energy. So uh, That's so good to hear. And I just want to say that um, there's a lot of things I want to say. <laughs> but I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sum it up like this. Thank you so much. Thank you again for uh, trusting that you could come on here and I would you know, respect you and we would have an honest dialogue. Thank you for coming on and telling your truth. Thank you for rebounding the way you have and doing what you do for Rashawn. I yeah. just feel connected to him. And I just, I believe that, that we, we, we're gonna get a movement. This is gonna yes. happen. We need it, definitely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's so much change that needs to happen. And yeah. I'm just glad, like I said, to be on this side of it now, to be on the solution side, not the problem. So I appreciate you guys having me on and making me feel comfortable, especially with the social anxiety of coming out of Good. prison. So. Good. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I'll, I'll hit you up next week. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Thanks again. Thank you.